I want to welcome everybody who's here so far. It is seven o'clock. So um, hi, I'm Anne. I'm the Adult Services Librarian here, and I am delighted to be welcoming Dr. Sarah McKinnon for her Badger Talk tonight. So thank you, UW-Madison, for making that possible, and thank you so much, Dr. McKinnon, for joining us tonight. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, whenever you're ready, feel free to get started. Fantastic. So let me just do a quick share screen and then I'll get us started. And thank you all for coming to this talk. I'm really excited to talk about uh, what's happening with the refugee and asylum system today. And um, hopefully we can answer questions if you have them at the end. So my goal for this presentation is to give us a bit of a history of the US refugee and asylum system, and then to move pretty quickly from there into a discussion of what it's like today. What does this system look like? Um, and I'll end with some more recent news that, have, that have, has arisen in the last, I would say, last few months. Uh, and I thought that that might be helpful to contextualize the conversation. So really, when we think about the US uh, system for refugees and asylum seekers, it's important to go back to the end of World War II. So in the aftermath of World War II, international leaders from around the world were really kind of flummoxed about what to do with this sort of crisis between the rights of individuals and the rights of states. Um, under the, the nation state system that had been developed, primarily at an international level, states had rights. And so World War II demonstrated just uh, how much of a problem that really was as various groups were, were exterminated, right? And so the international, the Universal Deco Declaration of Human Rights was really the first attempt to try to address this gap in um, the relationship between the parameters of a state and the parameters and the rights of individuals. And so the 1948 Declaration uh, of Human Rights outlined a series of articles that uh, the international community said these are the things that all individuals, regardless of where they live, are entitled to. Now, I cue in on this slide to Article 13 and 14 because these are the articles that are most specific to questions of immigration, questions of displacement. So Article 13 entitles everyone the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. And Article 14 states that everyone has the right to seek and enjoy in other countries asylum for persecution. Now, notice they don't say that everyone has the right to remain in those states or everyone has the right to receive asylum. These are elements that were um, given still to states. So this is, uh, again, where this relationship between individuals' rights and state rights remain. So we all, as individuals in this world, have the right to move and the right to seek asylum. But according to the UN Declaration of Human Rights, we do not have the right to receive asylum or stay. And so this is where this gap remains. Another element that was defined in the aftermath of World War II was who counts as a refugee. I mean, we saw displaced persons uh, in, in, a, in a way that I think the world had never seen before. Certainly there were refugees prior to World War II and there's some really great scholarship that, that uh, articulates and historicizes that. Um, but the 1951 UN definition of a refugee was really the first time that international leaders, again, came together to try to figure out who is a refugee? What is this category of persons? If we're really thinking about the relationship between individuals and states, um, you know, like we know who a citizen is, we know who these various subjects are, but who is a refugee? And this is the definition uh, that uh, world leaders agreed upon. A, a refugee is a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of 
being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside of their com uh, country of nationality and unable or unwilling to return to that country. And so this kind of goes on in legalese, but you get the sense of what this definition means. Right? Somebody outside of their country who has a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of one of those categories. When I talk in a moment about asylum seekers, those categories will become important. And so I just wanna put a pin on that um, idea for a minute. So World War II happens, aftermath, there's so much development of international protocol and regimes. Within the United States, there's really not there's a hesitancy to adopt this definition. In fact, this definition is not adopted by the United States until the 1980 Refugee Act, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Prior to that, between World War II and 1980, effectively the US admitted refugees when there was, when there were number one, fleeing communism. So that was a part of our definition of a refugee prior, prior to 1980 or when there was a special humanitarian concern to the United States. And really it was sort of a haphazard process. Um, it was a process through the pre presidential parole powers. And so 1980 comes about, well, prior to 1980, Congress, members of Congress, the Senate and the House, are, they're kind of getting frustrated with the presidential administration's ability to, you know, at whim decide um, who's going to be admitted as refugees. And so they take it as their task to begin to develop legislation to create a system for, for admitting refugees, for processing refugees. This is the 1980 Refugee Act. And this is still the piece of legislation that largely um, shapes and structures the refugee and asylum system today. The US system is similar to and uh, dissimilar to other nations systems. So I think one of the things that's very fascinating about refugee and asylum law is it looks different depending on the country. So this is where this the right of the state is very important. Each state who is an, a refugee and accepting state has the right to decide what their system is going to look like. And so the, this 1980 Refugee Act is really where we get uh, the definition, um, the outline of that within the United States. What I wanna do now for a moment is talk through what the system is like, and then I'm gonna move to our most recent administrations to talk more kind of at a micro level about what has the implementation of this act looked like in the last few years. So this chart I think is really useful because it helps us to understand the various systems. So the 1980 Refugee Act set up two processes and actually it's four as you see them on the slide, but I'm gonna talk about them in a more simplified way two processes for um, becoming a refugee in the United States. The first, which I'll speak first about, is refugee resettlement. The second is asylum or asylum seeking process. There are two processes in this country through which one can be received in the United States as a refugee. The refugee resettlement process is one we've been hearing a little bit about in the news lately. Um, and it's probably the one you think about the most when you think about refugee communities. So refugee resettlement happens when a conflict or a war happens in one country and refugees have to move to a neighboring country to probably refugee camps or settlements to live and they're there for a long time, right? They're there for years, sometimes decades. And there's a point when the, the international community recognizes, you know, 
there's no end in sight to this conflict. Our, in, our stability is not going to come about in this area of the world such that these individuals re, could, uh, could return home. And so we need to start thinking about another option, right? A more permanent settlement for these individuals It's and communities. So it's at this point that the... Um, the international community, so the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the Red Cross, various organizations suggest to Congress that a particular community, subset of a community, may need resettlement elsewhere. They may need third party, a resettlement in a third country. And so this goes through then, first Congress approves it, um, the Department of State is vetting it. The UNHCR, uh, the, which is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, suggests which refugees would be good for, for resettlement. And it goes through all of this vetting, right? And so this is this blue arrow that you see at the top. Um, and then someone might arrive in the United States already as a refugee. And at that point, they're working with volunteer agencies, they're getting set up with housing, with employment, through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. That's one process. So when we think of the communities such as the Somali community, Sudanese community, um, a lot of the Southeast Asian communities that are in our in our um, cities now, um, so many different groups. This is the the process that most of those groups came through. The other process. Well, actually, let me pause there and and kind of talk through some of these slides. So. In terms of where are these refugee communities resettled, we can see that across the United States, um, there are cities that have been identified for refugee resettlement. And these are cities where there are usually some sort of agency that's, that's present there. It could be Catholic um, Social Services, the International Rescue Committee, one, one of the volunteer age, refugee agencies that's there to do the sort of social service work for these groups. I always think what's fascinating is, yes, we see a lot of resettlement of communities along the coasts. So California, New York, Texas. Texas is a big state recently for refugee resettlement. But we also see refugee resettlements in some of our mid-sized cities around the, the country. So Lincoln, Nebraska, um, Des Moines, Iowa. Um, these are cities also that refugee resettlement happens. And when, when refugees are resettled through this process, they don't have a choice of where they're going, right? Um, they're, they're placed in a location and then they're resettled there. Movement can happen later. So maybe they decide, you know, later down the road, maybe they realize, oh, my, um, my aunt is in Columbia, South Carolina, so I'm gonna move there. But for the first part of it, they're resettled in a community. And those decisions are based on having an infrastructure, sometimes if there are uh, like uh, national or ethnic communities already in place, religious communities already in place, that's a factor that comes into play. But a lot of it is about economic need, economic stability for that community. So some of the factors about where refugees are resettled are really about, okay, where are where, where do we need employees, right? Where can we we host a, an influx of new workers? And so those are some of the logistics that go into that um, in, into that decision about where refugees are resettled. The number so uh, the president each year or you know for their years usually outlines the number of refugees that they. Um, want to identify as like the the annual ceiling cap like that is the the max that can be resettled um, you'll see that over the years the u.s refugee resettlement program rarely makes that um that cap and uh, it's gone up and down over the years so i think the lowest that it's been in in my me recent memory was um, with the previous administration. So President Trump, I think at the lowest number, it was 15,000. This was during the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, I think it was 25,000. 
um, as I'll talk about at the end of the, the this conversation, this talk, um, the current cap that President Biden has at has it at, I think, is at 125,000. So it's increased pretty significantly. But you'll see there there has been fluctuation, and that fluctuation oftentimes is also indicative of political dynamics that are happening or just various things that happen that this number goes up and down. And in terms of where refugees have been resettled from, you can see this, this is a rough map that gives us a sense of the, the broad regions for refugee resettlement. So um, Southeast or near Asia is a, has been a significant um, source of, of resettlement. So this includes um, Iraqi refugees, Syrian refugees. It also includes um, um, folks from from like Hmong communities. Um, this this is all kind of in that area. Um, African refugees have also been a part of the the large resettlement community. I think what you see a small amount of. I think the the number the figure that I always track in this is the Latin American Caribbean figures. You, you we don't really see a lot of refugee resettlement from from Latin America, and that is that is not for um, for lack of need, right? There's certainly questions of displacement and political um, instability and communities that definitely would fit that refugee definition. So that's one of the things that I think is also helpful to keep note of. All right, so I'm gonna go back to this, this slide because I wanna talk now about asylum seekers. So, Refugee resettlement, which I just discussed a moment ago, again happens when mass groups of same communities are approved for resettlement by Congress. Asylum seekers are individuals or families, usually it's small numbers, who arrive at or within the borders of the United States. And there's a range of ways. So these the different colors of the arrows are describing the different ways one might arrive at or within the borders of the United States. And when they do, they say, I can no longer return to my uh, country of nationality um, because I have a well-founded fear of persecution. And at the moment that someone states that or writes that in a form, um, the UN, the 1967 protocol of non-refoulement then is evo evoked. And this is something that the United States signed on to. It's a UN um, declaration protocol. And basically it obligates the United States not to remove someone, not to deport someone um, after they've made that claim. So to, to, to provide space to go through the process of evaluation um, to really determine if indeed someone fits the definition of a refugee. So asylum seekers have to prove that they fit that definition of a refugee. And now I'm gonna talk really quickly about these three different eras. So um, affirmative asylum seekers flee persecution. They come to the United States on a valid visa. That part is really important. So that might be a tourist visa, um, that might be a student visa, whatever the case is. And within a year, they apply for asylum. So they say, I can't return to my home country. Um, I need to, to go through this asylum process. These individuals don't go immediately before a judge. They have an interview with an asylum officer and the interviewer is really trying to determine and assess do they fit the, the, the conditions? They may be granted asylum and then they are recognized as a refugee. They may be denied asylum. And at that point they go through an appeals process that turns into um, what uh, asylum attorneys talk about as defense, a defensive asylum case. So then they're given the chance to go before a judge and defend their case. There are also individuals who um, kind of the other process is defensive asylum. So it's the, the arrow that's the, the orange arrow. So these are individuals who um, come to the United States. 
Um, and oftentimes without, doc without documentation, right, they're effectively not authorized to enter the United States, but they arrive at the border um, or they enter the United States and then uh, at some point claim asylum. Uh, because these individuals do not ha technically have a uh, valid visa when they make that application, they automatically go through the defensive asylum process. And this is an, a, a process that happens in immigration courtrooms through the Board of Immigration Appeals. And it, it's a little bit different because it's it's really about proving that you fit the definition. So it's, it's, it's a much more adversarial sort of process um, than the affirmative one, but that kind of boils it down. So what's unique about the US system of asylum is that we do have a separate court system for immigration. Not many countries do that. So many other countries, like I would say Canada, Sweden, to evaluate asylum seekers, they have, there is a refugee board and um, all asylum seekers go before that refugee board. It's not an adversarial judicial process, but here in the United States, we use a court system to uh, remediate and to make decisions on those cases. Okay, so who counts as, a, as an asylum seeker? So I first, I already said an individual or a small um, group, so maybe a family who arrives at or within the borders of the United States. At the point of arriving and saying, I have a well-founded fear of persecution, the next task is to prove or defend that you actually fit the definition of a refugee. There's a lot of complex elements here. So the first element is to demonstrate that you have a well-founded fear of being persecuted. So that's one element. And the other element is that it has to be on one of these categories, race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Notice there's a lot that's left out there. So this isn't just any form of violence, right? This has to be very specific. Now, the last two categories are the most ambiguous. So membership of a particular social group, for example, um, precedent now has established that if you are um, LGBT, so if you're the member of a gay, uh, lesbian, transgender um, community, um, that counts as a social group. So there are ways in which one can identify that. But for example, being a woman, that's too, the courts have said that's too broad to count as a social group. So merely experiencing gender-based violence, so violence on account of being a woman, does not automatically um, make one fit within this definition. So women claiming gender-based violence have to go through a few other rhetorical hoops to define their membership in a social group. And so these are elements that can become very challenging and are very complex for asylum seekers today. Okay, I think I've discussed the majority of what's on this slide, but if there are more elements that you want me to talk about, such as the detention centers or what the, the hearings look like before an immigration judge, I'm happy to do that during the Q&A. Feel free to just share those, or save those questions for then. I want to talk quickly about some of the changes under President Trump, because there were quite a few, and I, I don't know if you felt the same way, but I remember, you know, I, I study immigration and refugee issues, and I just remember being so at some point overwhelmed with all of the changes. Um, and then I'm going to talk at the end um, to wrap up uh, to the changes that have happened under President Biden. So under President Trump, one of the big things that Trump implemented was um, a protocol that was talked about as the Migrant Protection Protocol. Um, this was colloquial, colloquially known as the Remain in Mexico policy. So what, ha what happened is that uh, during the, his administration, non-Mexican nationals who arrived at the U.S. border were sent back to Mexico and said, you have to remain in Mexico and make your asylum hearing 
and case there. This was really the first time in, in contemporary history that the United Nations had gone against the, um, the, the protocol for non-refoulement and changed that up. And so there was a, a lot that happened in the refugee camps along the US-Mexico border. And I'm happy to talk about that more um, during the Q&A. Another thing we learned about is that families were separated at the border. This is a policy that was struck down by the courts, but there were still children that were separated from their families. This shifted a policy of maintaining children with families that again had been in place for many decades before that. President Trump also lowered the refugee camp to from, so President Obama had raised it to 110,000. Uh, and then Trump lowered it to 50,000 and then later to 15,000. So this was the lowest number it had been in ever really since the 1980 Refugee Act. It was a really significant shift in the, the refugee resettlement protocol. Um, President Trump also returned asylum seekers to, to, safe, to, to other countries under safe third country agreements. So this meant that, you know, if, for example, uh, a Guatemalan refugee or a, a refugee from Venezuela ha had first arrived in Mexico and then came to the United States, they would be returned to, to Mexico um, under the idea of the safe third country agreements. There were restrictions to work permits. There were restrictions to who was eligible for asylum. A lot of this happened under the, pres the precedent established by the attorney general. Um, Asylum seekers experienced restrictions to, to how much they could have access to attorneys. Asylum seekers aren't automatically given an attorney. So this isn't like the US criminal court where you know you're you have the right to an attorney. There's none of that. And but even so, those who were fortunate to have access to uh, attorneys oftentimes couldn't couldn't make appointments with those attorneys. Um, and there were policies that augmented how much detention was used as a deterrent strategy. Under President Biden, so some things have shifted. Again, lots of changes have happened. A lot of these changes happened within the first days of uh, President Biden taking office. And so we're still kind of seeing what they will mean um, when implemented. Uh, but let me talk through a few of them. So the refugee resettlement cap was raised, so it was moved. I think now uh, the last that I heard, um, President Biden said that uh, the cap was at 125,000. And I think, as I'll talk about in a moment with the uh, Afghan refugees that have been resettled, we've seen uh, a significant augment in, in the shift to ensure that the United States is doing its part in the refugee resettlement um, uh, process around the world. There had also been a travel ban that had been put in place for, for immigrants from various um, countries that, has, that was lifted. Um, this was colloquially known as the Muslim ban. So the Muslim ban was lifted by um, President Biden. There has been a uh, uh, an attempt to fortify the protections under DACA. So DACA is the process that's known as kind of the DREAM Act for protections for, for DREAMers or DACA students. So that has been fortified. Um, funding for the implementation of a wall at the U.S.-Mexico border has now ended. That, that, that sort of construction has stopped. Uh, the migrant protection protocol has stopped, although that hasn't meant that Mexico and Guatemala and El Salvador are not involved in deterring immigrants from arriving at uh, the United States, the border of the United States. And I can talk about that a little bit more. I think one of the things that I'm seeing a lot now is just how international, just how transnational um, immigration uh, deterrence really is. So the strategy contemporarily is uh, 
to try to make it impossible for immigrants even to make it to the U.S. border. And a lot of that happens by relying on the, the work of uh, migrant protections that are happening in Mexico, migrant protections that are happening in Guatemala. So I can talk about that a little bit in the Q&A if you want to hear more about that. Biden also implemented a family reunification task force for those uh, individuals, those children who had been separated from their family. And that seems to be uh, happening. It seems to be like that process is underway. And this is the last one is the, the kind of the most like nebulous, right? Um, President Biden established a plan to make the immigration system run more smoothly and efficiently. I don't know how that's, I don't know where that's at at this stage. I mean, I know a lot of that has meant um, trying to hire more immigration judges, more immigration officers, people to process visas. Um, there's just been a significant backlog in a lot of these cases. I work on a number of asylum seekers cases uh, as an expert witness. And sometimes the case, when I'm working with an attorney, the, the attorney will say, well, the case isn't scheduled to be heard until um, you know a year from now or two years from now. And so you see like significant backlog in the amount of processing that, um, that immigration officials are doing and the, the, the court system as well. So I wanted to end the talk with a quick just mention of what's been in the news recently regarding refugees and asylum seekers. And I'm happy to talk about these items if you have questions. So probably the thing that's on most of our minds or many of our minds is the fall of Kabul in Afghanistan to the Taliban regime and what that has meant for refugees from Afghanistan. So in the aftermath of that fall, of that coup, uh, there were a lot of Afghan individuals, who, a lot who had been working with the U.S. Uh, officials, the army, you know, the various groups that were there to you know, maintain that infrastructure. And so under that, that process, there are special visa programs for Afghan refugees who, had, who have been assisting um, the United States. And so there was a significant question mid-September of what's going to happen, especially the individuals who cannot make it out, out of Afghanistan. Um, a typical refugee resettlement process would have been there's a conflict in Afghanistan. Okay, the refugees move to a third country, a neighboring country, maybe Iran or Pakistan, and stay there. Um, but that didn't happen, right? We saw immediately a resettlement effort from Afghanistan to the United States and military bases across the country, including our own Fort McCoy, have now become refugee processing centers for these, I think it's uh, about 90,000 Afghan refugees that have been brought to the United States. This is a, a, an enormous task to, to do this sort of refugee resettlement in such a short amount of time. Um, and so in some ways, the refugee resettlement process has been flipped. So much of the vetting and the processing typically happens before refugees even arrive in the United States. Now that vetting and screening is happening while they are in places like Fort McCoy, um, with the hope that they can then be resettled soon in some of these communities uh, where there's an infrastructure for refugee resettlement. So that's one of the big things that's happened in the news recently about uh, refugees and asylum seekers. The other big thing has been what's happening um, in Del Rio, Texas, uh, with Haitian migrants who arrived in Del Rio. Um, and I can talk more about this in the Q&A, what, what happened there, what, how, how it was that so many Haitian um, migrants arrived in Texas. But this, is, this has also been in the news and we've learned that um, the 
effectively the sort of makeshift camp that was developed there, that was set up there, has now been closed down. And most of those Haitian migrants have been either placed somewhere so they can continue the screening process, or they've been de deported back to Haiti or a third country. And so these are some of the elements of what's happening with uh, refugees and asylum seekers right now in our world today. So that's all I have for you today. I will stop my presentation. I'll stop my share screen so we can talk about some of these issues. And, um, and I can, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Well, as we wait to see if people have questions, thank you yeah. so much. I, I know I learned a lot with that, so thank you. Yeah, no problem. Actually, I have a question. Um, can, you speak right. can you speak more, uh, a little more about um, how your your gender doesn't count as a as a social <laughs> group for for safety yeah for sure absolutely so this okay so this really comes about around in the late 1980s there are a number of asylum seekers from mostly from el salvador and guatemala fleeing the civil war right but but their experience during the civil war was sexual violence, right? Sexual assault, oftentimes by military officials. And so th they first arrive in the United States and they make a claim based on gender being their social group, right? But the, the, the judges who, who heard the case said, more that this is the the language kind of the the rebuttal to gender as a social group the the rebuttal was that more than half of a country's population is too large to count as a social group and so what this meant is that individuals women fleeing gender-based violence who wanted to claim gender as their social group had to do a lot of rhetorical work to define that social group more specifically so uh, a social group, a gendered social group that would work potentially would be something like women who have been abused by their spouses who oppose domestic violence, you know, like really something specific. And that was kind of what, what came about. And even in most of those cases, they weren't successful. Um, the courts would then say, well, that's private violence. That's not political violence. There are a lot of ways in which, um, especially well, even today, right? As, but there were so many ways in which women fleeing gender-based violence were just denied asylum at, kind of at every corner. And now um, the, the latest president, and I believe this is still standing, although I have to check it, 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 it was implemented under Jeff Sessions, Attorney General Jeff Sessions in 2018 said, um, fleeing uh, domestic violence is not uh, a grounds for, for, you know, claiming asylum. So that ba basically took that off the table as a grounds for applying for asylum. And, you know, if we think about what are women's experiences of violence, like that's a, a significant portion of it. So that was kind of, yeah, the way that went about. It's been, it's interesting to track the reliefs that have been implemented for, for women fleeing gender-based violence, because you see uh, it's, a, a, it's a pretty tenuous road um, if we think about the, the forms of violence that we, that are considered gendered forms of violence. I hope that answered your question. Uh, so it looks like uh, there is a question in the, the Q&A. So are there actions we can take as individuals, perhaps writing to legislators to help mitigate refugee issues? 
Absolutely, uh, writing to legislators is a really great thing to do. Um, if if you believe that the United States should be doing more uh, of a part as a part of this international community for for giving hospitality to refugee communities, then absolutely, especially when we hear of these situations, for example, the Haitian community in Del Rio, um, those are moments to reach out to our, our legal, our political representatives and to say, to say something. There are also really practical things that we can oftentimes do in our neighborhoods and our communities. For example, right now, I know with uh, Afghan refugees in Fort McCoy, they just need stuff right like warm clothes for the winter because this is you know like winter is not <laughs> this is going to be a new thing so like um, donating to the salvation army or things like um donations of like house goods you know like eventually individuals who are in that program and resettled will have their own apartments and will have um, a need for just items for the kitchen or for you know the living room so those are also little things that we can do um yeah but i think that those are significant steps and keeping an eye on what's happening with refugees in 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 the news i think can can also just can, yeah it can be helpful to keep it in our minds i like to always in my mind remember that the united states with if we if we're to look at per per like inhabitants there are 0.8 refugees per 100,000 people in the United States, 0.8. There's not even one refugee per 100,000 um, individuals in, in the United States. Whereas we look at countries where there's civil instability, if you look at the neighboring countries, they are housing and hosting the world's refugees. So if you think about like Lebanon, there are 400 refugees per 100,000 inhabitants. Um, uh, Iran, same. I mean, like the, the numbers go up. It's really significant. The majority of the world's refugees, 94% of the world's refugees will never make it to a place like the United States or France or Sweden where they can actually um, like remake a life, resettle and rebuild a home. That that's just that's a pipe dream for most refugees. And so I like to keep that in my mind because I think um, those of us in and more developed nations can be doing more of a part. Well, I don't see any more questions coming okay. in. I'll give it just a second to see if anybody's madly typing. But. Yeah, not a problem. And uh, if there are other questions, I'm always available. I'll just type my my email address. If other questions come up, feel free to send me a message. I'm always happy to talk about these issues. Well, thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Absolutely. We appreciate your time. Excellent. I'm happy to join you all. Great. Well. Thank you very much and have a good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.